Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Well, thank you for coming. My name is Richard Cooper, and I am president and CEO of NY Spin, a not-for-profit corporation. I'd like to uh, thank our sponsors. Big Visible has been a sponsor for several years, and we greatly appreciate their support. We're happy to be returning to ThoughtWorks. We'll also be hosting next month's meeting, so that will also be here. And now I'm going to introduce Bill, who is going to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Good evening. Our speaker for tonight, Ram Srinivasan, is someone who believes in contributing to the community. He does so as a, as a transformational catalyst, an agile coach, and trainer. He's going to speak to us about what makes me successful and what can even make that fun. Let's give a warm welcome to Ram Srinivasan. Thank you, Ram. Wow, that was a great introduction. I was looking for the person behind me. Somebody else. <laughs> right? So let me ask you a question. What one thing, if you could learn tonight, will make this meeting worthwhile for you? What one thing, if you could learn tonight, would make this meeting worthwhile for you? The time is when you're yeah. Making meetings more productive rather than cause conversations and get more time. Okay, making meetings more productive. Any other answers? Yes. Making meetings shorter. Making meetings shorter. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? From this side of the room? Any answers from this side of the room? I think it's having people look forward to attending other meetings. Oh, having people look forward to attending another meeting, which is not boring, right? Abolishing meetings. Abolishing meetings. <laughs> Why? Why would you say that? Because they're also terrible. Oh, they're boring, <laughs> right? Let's really look at ways we can make meetings more interesting, and we can get more results out of a meeting, right? Technology, sometimes, you'll know, doesn't always work as expected. This is me. I encourage you to connect with me in LinkedIn. And uh, yeah. These are something which I call as working agreements. We want to create an environment <coughs> where you can learn optimally and you can get the maximum out of this time, right? We are going to time box our meeting to 45 minutes so that we have some time for questions and we all can go home in time. What I'm going to do is run my countdown timer here. Okay. <laughs> Participation. You can interrupt me during the conversation. I'll answer your questions. And if there are some questions which are beyond the scope of the discussion, I would encourage you to take a sticky note or post-it note. Write down your question and put it in the parking lot. We have a parking lot here and we have a parking lot there. Right? I promise. <laughs> I will answer those questions by the end of the meeting, right? My participation is necessary here. He's recording it. I'm the invited speaker. I cannot really walk out. But your participation is all voluntary. If you find it boring, just walk out. Rule of two feet, right? Electronic gadgets, a lot of you know, it sometimes is annoying. But today, I give you the permission to use it, especially to tweet, right? So if you are on Twitter, you can tweet and white spin, you can tweet facilitation, and you can also tweet with my uh, Twitter handle, right? We talked about the parking lot, right? Do we need to really talk about anything else for our working agreement to make this meeting successful within this 45 minute time period? Just a quick question. Do you want the questions just be posted, or can we just? Yeah, you ask me a question. If I tell you to write it in a parking lot, just write it and put it, right? Okay. What are some of the reasons why meetings are ineffective? Right? Somebody told meetings are boring, right? right? Yes? Participants don't prepare properly for the meeting. People don't prepare properly for the meeting. Wow. I'm actually doing the introduction right now. Yes. Some people don't show up for the meeting. Shit, don't show up. Wrong participants. Right? Especially if this happens, then um, the CEO or the CXO sets the meeting, and the meeting assistant, <laughs> meaning the personal assistant, is inviting people. They invite everybody who's needed and who's not needed, and some people really show up because it's the invitation from CXO, 
and they're feeling bored. Right? Any other reasons why you think meetings can be very disengaging? Yes, sir? Every meeting is seven minutes late. Every meeting is seven minutes late, and I'll have a cure for that. <laughs> I have a cure for that. Right? Right? Some of the reasons are no one is facilitating a discussion. It's actually conflict of thoughts, and people are really arguing about their point of view without really collaborating to find, find something which is useful to all of them. Lack of closure in discussions, meaning you take up a topic, you don't have the right participants, and then you kind of run out of steam and, oh yeah, he's not here, we cannot really decide on this, let's really look at what we can do next. Right? Yes? I have one more thing, people are busy doing other things with technology rather than taking technology. Oh, engagement, <laughs> right, right. Do you know that, uh, I'm actually doing a lot of stuff in gamification, do you know that TV has reduced our engagement time from 50 minutes? You went to college or school, your class hours is 50 minutes, right? TV has reduced it to 20 or 25 minutes because they have the commercial breaks. Internet, Twitter, Facebook has reduced it to 10 minutes. The biggest thing today in US is teens, teenage guys and girls are not really prepared to drive because primarily they cannot tweet, they cannot check their email, Right? Because there's a lack of engagement, right? When people became less engaged, guess what's happening? They're really looking for electronic toys. Right? And that's why I gave you the open permission to tweet about this. Right? I'm using it constructively. Right? I am so I cannot really it. Okay, I have to keep moving. <laughs> <laughs> Effective meetings, right? <laughs> they have group norms, they have conflict management strategies. And you have specific goals and outcomes which you achieve in the meeting. Right? Anybody think of anything else in which uh, meetings can be effective? One of my managers said, if you can't attend the meeting, send someone who can make decisions on your behalf, which I thought was really nice, because that's often a problem. Yes, exactly. Sometimes people lack decision-making authority, and that ruins the meeting. Right? <laughs> Everybody is there, but the decision-making person is not there, and boom, the meeting kind of just fades away. Right? Any other things which can make the money? Uh, no uh, action item assignments and due dates. Oh, action as assignments, right? Action charts. We'll talk about this in the tools, mm -hmm. right? Yes, Bill. Sometimes people just don't want to do something from the group. They want to insist on doing something their way, so there'll never be an agreement. You have the arguments that just oh. keep going and never get resolved. So Interesting, yeah. I mean, you don't, really, don't have a specific way to manage conflict but that's the ineffective way. And we look at effective strategies for managing conflict, right? Before I attend the meeting, or before you attend the meeting, you really need to ask three questions. And that's all you need to ask, right? What is the purpose of this meeting? Why am I going to be spending my time, my precious time in this meeting? What is the most important question that will be answered at the end of this meeting? I want some results. I want to know why this meeting happened. I want to know why I spent my time there, right? And third thing is, what are my deliverables? Right? I'm using a visual management tool here, if you really don't know what this is. Right? This is uh, just a visual management thing. I'm doing my introduction right now. Right? There are three types of meeting. The first thing is called status meeting. Right? Your manager calls in and you are dealing with multiple projects, and you're really asking for, like, oh, what is the status of this project? Right? In Agile and Scrum, we have a daily standup, right? which specifically answers three questions. What did I do yesterday? What am I planning on doing today? And what are my impediments? Right? That's the first kind, called status meeting. Right? It's very short. The purpose is very clear. Everybody shares their status with other participants. The other kind of meeting is called work meeting, where you are creating something or making a decision. You're doing a project plan, right? You're a uh, project chartering meeting. It's a work meeting, right? If you're an agile world, your sprint review meeting and your sprint retrospective meetings, they are work meetings, right? And the third one is actually the hybrid meeting, right? This is where you partly talk about a status and then really go into details to really find working solution. Think about a strategy meeting, right? Multiple departments come in, they really talk about what's happening in their respective departments, and then find a way to collaborate, to arrive at some solutions. Now that's just the beginning. People will actually move forward with action items after that too, right? One of the major tragedies, or train wrecks I would rather say, is when 
intentionally or unintentionally, your status meeting goes to a hybrid meeting. People are in the status meeting, and then they start solving problems. Have you seen that happen? Yes. Right? Have you seen that happen? <coughs> right? And especially this is true because the first guy <coughs> is talking about his problem, and there are other managers who are now not really engaged. Right? They start typing. Right? They're checking emails. And then they actually, if somebody asks them a question, they actually ask you back, right? Oh, sorry, I missed it. Can you repeat your question again? Right? So this is actually the challenge with technology too. So we will talk about technological challenges very soon. You have 37 minutes, right? <laughs> to understand this better, right? I want to clarify a few rules in your meetings every day. We primarily will be talking about work meetings. <coughs> Status meetings are simple, you can handle it. We'll be talking about work meetings, right? The first one is sponsored, right? The very first question you need to ask anybody is, who is the sponsor for this meeting? Right? <coughs> Sometimes there's a decision-making authority, and somebody here said that, hey, if you cannot really attend the meeting, send somebody who can make decisions on your behalf, right? So he's a person authorized by the sponsor to make decisions. The second person, important, equally important, is the facilitator, right? He creates the environment for the meeting. Uh, he is somebody who actually holds the team or the group together. Right? Participants, primarily your team members, primarily your uh, members who are invited for the meeting, they might belong to a team, they might belong to multiple teams, they might belong to different organizations. Observer is a role where people just want to watch. Right? The role is very specific. They cannot participate in the meeting, they cannot distract in the meeting, and you can have this in your working agreements and what the role of obser observer should be, right? Another one is timekeeper, right? Uh, Richard offered me to really give me prompts about time. He's a timekeeper for this meeting. I use some tool like this, right? It helps me monitor where I, and how much I'm progressing, right? I have 35 minutes left. Yeah. I have more. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll open it up for questions. So my limit is 35, I have a buffer, right? So this brings up a question of, what is facilitation, right? Facilitation started in 1960s and 70s, primarily from a branch of psychology and organizational development, where they really recognized the need for somebody other than the major stakeholders in a meeting to participate in the meeting and to help participants arrive at a decision, right? The facilitator gates the participants to arrive at a decision in a meeting. Right? He maintains the energy level of the meeting. Right? He is not really going to let them uh, get disengaged. Right? He's going to manage the conflict dynamics of the meeting. Right? And this is the important point. Right? Facilitator remains really neutral. Right? If I go as a facilitator for an organization, and if I'm facilitating a retrospective meeting, for an example, or maybe a chartering meeting, for example, I want to stay neutral because I don't want to appear to take sides. Because if I appear, I might not even be taking sides, but if I appear to even take sides with somebody, I lose my credibility as a facilitator. Right? They lose the trust which they have in me as a facilitator to hold their environment together. Right? Most meetings don't really recognize the need for a facilitator. And Agile actually does something very different. Agile explicitly recognizes the need for a facilitator. In fact, the field of facilitation itself was born from DSDM, which is a methodology, Agile methodology. And uh, they started the International Association of Facilitation from that. Right? So DSDM is very active in the UK. And uh, DSDM expect people to be really good facilitators if you are a DSDM pro Agile project manager. Right? And the other thing is the facilitator provides the tools and techniques necessary to run the meeting. Right? Who can facilitate? That's the major question here. Right? Ram, we have never seen a facilitator facilitate a meeting. Has anybody seen a facilitator facilitate a meeting? Right? What meeting was it, sir? Uh, it was a status meeting. It was a status meeting. OK, and uh, what kind of project was that? Software development. OK, is it agile or regular? Oh, no, it wasn't agile. It was an agile, OK? Anybody, somebody raise your hand? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but again, way before Agile was the old waterfall. Okay. 
Did you did you have an internal facilitator or an external facilitator? Um, I've been, I've, I've seen both. You have seen both, right? Yes, sir. Gate review internal facilitator. Sorry. Gate review internal. Oh, gate review internal facilitator. Uh, is he a stakeholder on the project? Uh, they have to, the chart of the meeting along. Mm -hmm. Is he a guy from a PMO? Uh, select the business line. I see. Okay. Good. Right. Um, there are organizations like Rally, Rally Dev is a software company, and they recognize the need for a facilitator, and my friend, uh, Laura Rook, who's actually an expert in facilitation, works there as a corporate facilitator. I mean, she facilitates all the CEOs, CFO, CIO, CTO, and all those guys, right? And she is she's respected because everybody agrees that they need a facilitator, right? Sometimes, it's very hard to find external facilitators. You can use internal facilitators then, right? You need external facilitators if you're really going in for an off-site retreat, where you're really expecting a lot to be produced in a particular meeting, right? Your internal facilitators might not have the tools and techniques necessary to facilitate a large meeting. Facilitating 30 people is different from facilitating 300 people, right? The tools and techniques you employ is different. How do you really manage conflict between two groups, two business groups? I mean, an internal facilitator who is not really well trained cannot do that. There are advantages with external facilitator, right? He is not getting sucked into your company politics, whereas it's not true for internal facilitators, right? And he can afford to take more risk. Yes, Bernard. Would you regard the scrum coach role as basically that of a facilitator? Scrum coach is a coach and a facilitator. Uh, there are competencies which overlap and. Do me a favor, Bernard, write that down and put it in a parking lot and I will answer that question during the question time, right? Leaders as facilitators, right? The major challenge is, this is what you see in corporate environment today. Managers, team leads, they are facilitating a meeting all the time, right? And they are expecting results. And they actually, it's a meeting convened to tell you what you need to do. Anybody seen that? Right? The disadvantage of this is, they cannot really act as neutral facilitators. They would be appearing biased towards their decisions. And it's difficult to switch between role, a neutral role of a facilitator and a role as a participant, as an influential stakeholder, who needs to influence people in decision making. Right? Now, we really talk about facilitation as a field, right? I would really tell you something, once you start a meeting, there's a lot of stuff happening when you prepare a meeting, right? Yes, a facilitator prepares well ahead of the meeting so that he can make the interview more productive. Have you ever seen meetings where people ask you, uh, what else guys, um, what else guys, right? See that? That actually means the guy is not prepared for the meeting, right? The best way to prepare for a meeting is have a meeting agenda, right? You generate your meeting agenda by knowing who your sponsor is. Yeah, I can use this. I don't know if I can use it or not. Uh, and doing a sponsor interview. Right? And your sponsor interview is one simple question. Right? Imagine that your meeting produced the results which you are pleased with. What is the thing which the teams did which made the meeting worthwhile? That's it. You don't have to really read deep into that statement, but this will help you understand what is expected out of a specific meeting. The sponsor has major stake in the outcome of the meeting. Right? The other thing you need to really do is participant interview. Right? You really need to find out why participants are participating in the meeting, what's in it for them. Right? Everybody is asking the same question, what's in it for me? The first question I ask you today is like, hey, what's in it for you guys to attend this meeting? You are expecting something to learn, right? And as a facilitator, you need to take care of logistics, location. Bill and Richard were kind enough to take care of the logistics, location, and the sponsors were really kind enough to take care of the food and the arrangements and the supplies and all this kind of stuff. And if you're really organizing a big meeting, remember this, you need to be in the room if your meeting starts at 10.30, you need to be in the room at 10 o'clock. So book your rooms. Outlook has this feature, right? A lot of people use Outlook, right? You have a feature to add room 
right, just by the meeting, right? That doesn't really work if your meeting needs preparation, right? You come at 10 o'clock for your 10 o'clock meeting and you start preparing the room, you're wasting everybody's time. As a facilitator, you need to be much ahead so that you can prepare the room and conduct the meeting. Your meeting can start at right at 10 o'clock, if it's a 10 o'clock meeting, right? The second thing is agenda for the meeting, right? We talked about the sponsored interview, right? Your sponsored interview will generate a lot of questions and you need to base your agenda based on your sponsored interview and your participant interview, right? Agenda is typically an orderly flow of information, right? What am I going to do now? What am I going to do later? How sequence of what activities and what sequence of activities will be there during the course of the meeting, right? And you need to ask a series of questions to arrive at the agenda. So you need to do sponsor interviews, participant interviews, to really know their motives, the politics, the dynamics of the organization. And this is really needed if you are an external facilitator. Maybe you need to know a lot of these things if you are an internal facilitator. But if you are an external facilitator, you need to prepare well ahead of time interviewing your sponsors and participants to generate the agenda for a meeting. Right? This is an agenda for a retrospective meeting. Right? Talks about the facilitator, talks about the participants, recognizing them, you know, our team is called superheroes, uh, that's the SOA team. They like to call themselves superheroes for whatever reason, and we respect that, right? And the location is described, and look at that, the time is 10.45 to 12.15. It's 90 minutes, right? I do this very specifically because people usually start meeting at like say 10 o'clock and ended at 10.30, and if they have a meeting again at 10.30, they don't have the time to come and attend your meeting, right? Maybe they need to go for a bio break, maybe they need to grab a cup of coffee, right? Setting a meeting at this point of time helps you make sure that participants arrive on time. Somebody said all meetings start seven minutes late, right? This is the cure for that. Schedule a meeting, offset it a little bit so that they Everybody is on time, right? Another thing, if you really add up all these times, I actually have some buffer. 15, 20, 40, 55, 60, 70, 80. I have 10 minutes buffer, right? My meeting is not really fully packed. I have some buffer, right? How am I doing with time? And we have a question. Yes. Yeah, you said about starting at an odd time. My yeah. teammate and I start all meetings five minutes late, and for the most part that works. But then you get the people who know that your meeting starts at 10.05 to come at 10.10. 10. How do you deal with that? Right. We will talk about it in the team agreements, right? That's when we actually have the team agreements. That's a great question. You know, what I would say is like, guys, we all agreed with our teaming agreement that participation, punctuality is something which is important to us. I'm observing, I wouldn't really pinpoint them. I'm observing that a lot of us are coming late. What is happening here? Right? Facilitation is the art of asking the right question and framing the right question, right? to actually make them accountable for that, right? You really don't know. I actually had a guy who was coming late to the daily stand-up, which was at 10 o'clock, which everybody agreed on in our team. And we asked them, hey, what's happening, right? And the guy actually said, I had to switch three trains, right? And if I miss a connection, I'm late, right? Can we push the stand-up meeting by 15 minutes to 10, 15? Team felt it's reasonable. Everybody agreed on it. The guy was on time every time, right? Until and unless you really know what is stopping them from coming to the meeting, talk about it in your teaming agreements. If the teaming agreements get violated, talk about it and ask them what needs to be done. Not every meeting is a team. We'll, we'll talk about that. Every meeting should have a working agreement or team norms. Right? So when we started off this meeting, we have a working agreement and team norms. Right? So here comes the meet. Right? Prepare for the meeting with an agenda. <coughs> This is like a cookie, right? Here is the meat of the meeting. So you have the meeting. There are three parts to a meeting. One is the power start. The second one is the power up question with divergence tools, power on questions, and convergence tools. We'll talk about this a little bit. And then, like the audio cookie, we have closing steps, including action steps, retrospectives, and cleaning up the place, right? Let's talk about what a power start is, right? This is where you grab the attention of the participants in the first five minutes. All you grab as a facilitator, regardless of whether you're an internal facilitator, external facilitator, or a leader, is the first five minutes to grab somebody's attention, right? During the first five minutes, 
You establish context. Why are you here? Continuity. Recap previous meetings. Recap previous retrospectives if you're doing retrospectives. You establish your stance as a facilitator, establishing neutrality. Self-governance, which actually help in terms of conflict, right? in terms of when somebody is coming late. Right? And that's why every meeting should have self-governing norms, or working agreements, or team norms, right? and consensus. Right? We establish consensus primarily because people are going to act on their decisions if they agree with <coughs> what they actually say. Right? You cannot force me to do anything which I don't like to do. Right? But if I give an idea myself, and if I can live with this, or if somebody gives an idea and I can live with this, that's called consensus. Right? I can live with this. Right? This is the power start. The first five minutes is what is most important in your meeting. Right? Let's go to power up questions. Right? Begin your question with words that create pictures. Right? Our brain is really good in visualizing. People can keep talking, 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 but if you really want them to think and be engaged, create visual pictures, right? Use words like imagine that. Consider a scenario, right? Think about a time. Those words simulate thinking in terms of visual pictures, right? The second step is tell a brief story about it, right? Expand on that. Maybe teams already did something. Talk about it. Or talk about a hypothetical scenario. Imagine that our team is accomplishing this project in this specific time. What are the things we need to do to accomplish this within this particular time? Right? And precisely, that's the third step, precisely frame your question with your agenda item. That is all you need to do. Right? This simulates people's creativity and thinking. Right? There's something called power on question. You open up your meeting after your puppet start with a power up question, right? And then you can have people participate in it. Right? It's called power on question, which helps people build on top of ideas, right? Questions like, there are some things which need clarification. I am a facilitator, I'm taking notes. I need to, and you need to actually have people think deeper about it. You can help them with power on questions. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but this presentation will be available and you can take notes, right? There are tools which actually help you with idea generation. You have power up questions, you have power on questions, and there are basically only two tools which help you with idea generation. One is brainstorming tools, right? That's where participants gather together in smaller groups or in fishbowl discussions or groups of four, five, six, right? And discuss ideas which help the meeting, right? It's called divergence, right? You're generating ideas, right? And then the second part, or this another way is listing, right? You list down thoughts, you list down action items, I mean, not really action items, you list down various features, you list down various aspects of a particular challenge, and you really try to see how you can um, solve that particular challenge, right? There are variations of this, including mind maps, math, sat, flat, a lot of activities, right? But think about it. If you start up a meeting with a power up question, and have participants interacting and engaging with each other, how engaging would the meeting be? How engaging would the meeting be? Yes. Oh, very, okay, depends, right? I can assure you one thing, you won't get it right the first time, you need some experience facilitating more meetings, right? But today, you got tools which can help you facilitate, the, facilitate a meeting in a better fashion. And there's a second part to it. First is you are generating ideas, that's the divergence, and there are only basically two processes which help you converge thoughts, right? One is grouping, another one is prioritizing, right? There are variations of this, including dot voting, you can just get stickies, vote. you can vote with pen, paper, you can just modify the rules, but basically, convergence helps in decision making. You can use meetings to produce ideas or for decision making. And if it's just ideas, you can use any idea generation tool. And if it's for decision making, you can use any of these convergence tools. Right? How are we doing with time? 18 minutes. Right? 
So the question is, how do I really run a meeting where everyone participates, right? So I have my idea generation divergence tools, I have my convergence tools, right? What are the different ways I can facilitate meetings better, right? Everyone participates, especially this is true for introverts, right? You as a facilitator should hold the space for introverts, right? You should give them an opportunity to participate, right? Round robins work perfectly well. Everybody takes turns, round robin works great, right? Or you can have people write down their thoughts silently on a post-it. They can write it down on a post-it and then stick it and then you can revisit it later, right? There are multiple activities, divergence and convergence activities, which can help you, especially with silent writing, right? My favorite one is this, right? Can we hear, if somebody keeps dominating a meeting, right? I don't really pinpoint, I don't say, oh, stop dominating the meeting. All I say is, can we hear from people who have not spoken so far, right? And the crowd goes silent. And that actually opens up the space for introverts to talk, right? And I learned one thing. You need to learn how to be silent. And you need to be patient. And you need to be comfortable with silence as a facilitator, especially when people are thinking. People are very uncomfortable with silence. Go to a meeting tomorrow, don't talk for two minutes. People are getting nervous a little bit, like, what's this guy doing, right? People are very uncomfortable with silence, and that's very true when somebody's an extroverted guy, and he's trying to break the silence, and I actually say, like, can we hear from people who have not spoken so far? And the room is silent, and if you're really having difficulty being silent, I tap my feet, one, two, three, four, five, and I count within myself, right? And that will keep you engaged, but give them the space to think. Dysfunctional behavior is something you need to learn how to handle, right? <laughs> Never humiliate somebody in public, right? Never use your power or authority to subdue someone. Never use anger, right? Never criticize somebody in public. These are some basic stuff, right? So you as a facilitator need to hold that environment, right? If it's getting out of hand with conflicts, right? That's when my working norms come into picture, right? If there's a conflict heating up, I really see it, right? Guys, we talked about handling conflicts in our working norm. I didn't explicitly have this here in this presentation, but when I go to a meeting, I actually say, how do we handle disagreements and make sure that we are not collaborating and we are not really having heated exchange of arguments? What should we do? And I wait. People really don't want to talk about conflicts. You as a facilitator should help them talk about conflict and be comfortable with it. They should collaborate, right? There's a great uh, model called Speedly is Conflict Model. Speedly is, is a password, and uh, he actually found that a lot of people were having a lot of fights in church, right? And so he came up with this, he studied this, and really figured out how people think, why people really fight, and what I do as a facilitator is just reflect the environment, right? When people are arguing, I just say what I see. I see that there are a lot of differences of opinion. And I see that this is not helping our agenda. And I ask them, what will help us get back to our meeting agenda? Right? This, yes? So who, who, was, who made this uh, methodology of? Speed Lies. Spirits. Speed Lies. Speed Lies. Yeah. Speed Lies. Right? So you need to have explicit. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's cool. So you need to have explicit ways to handle conflict even before it happens, right? Does anybody have a conflict agreement with their team at this point in time on how to manage conflicts? Why is that? Okay, what is that you can do to have a conflict agreement? Create a team norm, right? Create a team norm, right? Your team norms would include electronic tools, um, conflict agreements, uh, punctuality, time boxes, anything else which needs to be addressed, right? And we talked about silence too, right? My tools, my favorite tools are these, right? Flip charts, sticky notes, index cards, masking tape, and whiteboard markers. I prefer these to PowerPoint, to electronic tools, 
primarily because these create ways people can be engaged in a meeting. Right? If I have a PowerPoint presentation, people are checking their email. Right? Not, not paying attention. Right? The PowerPoint will anyway come in the slides, I mean in the email. Why, why do I really bother about it? And you need to really design your activities with these, if it's a co-located meeting, to help them get the best of the meeting. Right? How are we doing with time? 12 minutes. There's something called parking lot, right? Bernard asked me a question, right? A lot of times your meetings will involve heavy discussions. And sometimes questions might come which may be important but may not be relevant to the agenda at that point in time. Right? You as a facilitator can ask people to use sticky notes or whatever you want to use, post questions in the parking lot. And never skip those questions. Don't use a parking lot to dodge questions. Make sure you answer all the questions at the end of the meeting when you leave. We don't have parking lot questions here. Oh yeah, we do have one there, okay. And it's not a way to escape from questions, right? You talk about questions during the meeting, but this is an exceptional thing. I want to address it, but I want to stay focused in my meeting right now, right? Question? Yes. You said answer all the parking lot questions by the end of the meeting. Some of them are going to be irrelevant to the meeting. Why should they be discussed at the meeting? Yes, very true. You will know that by the end of the meeting. You will know that you might have a lot of answers by the end of the meeting, right? And you might really want to see if this question is still relevant or not. Right? I will show you how I handle this. Yes, sir. You may not have the right people you may to answer that question. Yes, that's true. That's true. That's why I have something called action chat. Right? It actually says. What, who, and when. Every meeting which I do ends with action items. If your meetings, or especially work meetings, if they don't end up with action items, it's just a waste of time, right? You are just there, coming up, and then you'll have another meeting which is still boring too, right? And you follow up your meeting with continuity, power stuff, remember, right? If people are not there in this meeting, but you have action items assigned to them, you need to take their permission to assign them specific tasks. And somebody needs to take ownership about talking with somebody else who is not there in the room at that point in time so that that particular task can be accomplished by them. Right? My favorites right, is visually managing meetings. I use something like this to manage meetings. My timer is something which I use to manage my meetings. I ask for volunteer participation, right? In my meetings, everybody who attends the meeting is a volunteer, right? I don't have anybody come in forced, right? People ask me this, Ram, how will this work? And I tell them, like, hey, if the guy is going to be idle in the meeting anyways, right, why waste his time? Let him do whatever he wants to do. Let's see who is interested in coming in because they will actually take action to those particular action steps in the action chat. Right? If you're not interested in the meeting, you're only going to be distracting other people. Right? Adhering to the time box, right? that is my favorite. That's one of my favorites. The reason is this. People value their time. And if you, cons if you tell people that you value what they value, they respect you. If you can take one thing out of today's meeting, start your time meeting exactly at the same time when you told you would start, and end your meeting when you told that you would end it and use visual management tools like this, like a timer. If you really don't like the electronic tool, then you can go to Amazon, buy a countdown timer, which is a physical tool, put it up in your wall, and people exactly know how much time is remaining. Right? I don't prefer electronic tools because they are distraction. I have a stopwatch in my countdown timer in my uh, PDA and my hi-fi device too, but I don't use it because if I start using it, others might also use it, and then you will be tempted to check your email and your engagement gradually goes down. So I like physical tools which are specific to me. Right? Third, fourth thing is keep them moving. People keep sitting in one place, they really get bored. My strong suggestion is use exercises and activities to get them engaged. Right? I want to really see about this exercise. Right? Today, I'm going to give you four minutes, well, actually two minutes. <laughs> I don't have much time. <laughs> Yeah, I have eight minutes, right? 
You got two minutes to form groups of fours and talk about one thing which you learned in today's meeting. Two minutes. Let's go. Two minutes. <laughs> groups of four. signifies an end of an activity, right? If you are facilitating 500 people, <laughs> right? this is a lot more effective. It's exponential, rather, right? than actually shouting and trying to gather attention. So next time you go and facilitate a meeting, try this. Guys, when you see me raise my hand, stop what I'm doing and raise your hand, right? The best record I have for this, and you need to keep track of this, the best record I have for this is about I facilitated 120 people, and everybody stopped seven seconds precisely <laughs> after I raised my hand. 120 people, right? Try to challenge the group to see if they can do it faster than that. <laughs> <laughs> that way, you can get them to collaborate and then stop when you want them to stop, right? So, Ron Robin. What did you guys learn, and what is that you will be using in your next meeting, this team? Uh, we talk about the conflict management having been not widely uh, practiced in our workplace. Great. One bullet point. What did you learn, and what did you use? They will use conflict management and conflict resolution agreements in their working agreements to manage me. OK. How about you? One bullet point. Time box in action. Handbox and action points. Great. <coughs> Got team. One bullet point. What will you use and what which you learned today? It's our bullet point. We just talked about time <laughs> boxing. Time boxing. Okay, time boxing is a famous thing. How about this group? What did you guys Time boxing. Time boxing. Oh, okay. time boxing is famous now. <laughs> okay. Oh, great question. Save that. You know, I wanna address that. How about this team? Actually, I think you've got a virtual question for her up there. Yeah. What is the one bullet point? Facilitators. Facilitators. How about this team? Well, we had time box, but we also had that up there on the board. Ah, to visually track visually. where they are in ah. the meeting. Yeah, exactly. That's a very good tool because not only am I priming you with a concept which you really need to think about, you know what's going to happen, it's all transparent, but 
you know where we stand, right? How are we doing with time? Oh no, we got uh, three minutes. Okay, okay, cool. So, let's talk about parking lot questions, right? I promised I will answer parking lot questions at the end of this meeting. This meeting is about to conclude. I want to address these questions. This is time for questions, right? I work in healthcare and there is, I want somebody to read it. Yes, sir, please. <laughs> I work in healthcare hospital. Uh -huh. and there's an industry perception that it is okay to delay meetings. The patient has a problem, there was an emergency. Uh -huh. How do you deal with that mindset when it's industry wide? Wow, how would you really like to deal with it when it's industry wide? You know, it's okay to be late in an industry because of whatever issue, you know, emergencies, urgent care. Right. How would you deal with that? Yes, sir. Have shorter meetings. Have shorter <laughs> meetings. Okay. Or right. have a delegate if possible, if somebody cannot show up. Have a delegate. Have have them delegate. Okay. Right. Have them delegate to somebody so that they can actually. Okay. Right. Cool. Yes, sir. Any other solution? Find a time when they're less likely to have an emergency. Find a time like less likely to have an emergency. You know what? You <laughs> cannot. Go and propose these solutions. Yeah. As a facilitator, next time when everybody is going to be there in a meeting, you need to ask us, guys, we have this challenge in our <coughs> industry. Right? But we need to address it at least in our organization. How can we address this challenge? Remember, you are a facilitator. You want answers from them so that you can hold them accountable for the answers. Right? Next parking lot question. <coughs> Why is the sky blue? <laughs> How to handle irrelevant questions? Wow. Is this question relevant, guys, for this meeting? Will this make the best use of all our time? Why is the sky blue? I mean, how do you handle irrelevant questions? Right? I asked the group if this question is relevant. Yes. <laughs> to this group, facilitating meetings, yes. But if it's not, a facilitating meaning. You, I will show you how actually I handle this, right? Uh, there is a scrum coach role as a facilitator, right? Uh, Bernard, this is actually a great question, but this is beyond the scope of this meeting, right? A scrum coach will act as a coach. The competencies of a coach are different, and competencies of a facilitator are different, but there are overlapping areas because you are helping a team, an organization, right? And that's what I specialize in organizational coaching. If you want, we can talk about it later. Does it answer your question, sir? How to handle irrelevant questions? Okay. Any types for conference call meetings with remote teams? One thing I really want to tell is, okay, so, guys, we are out of time. <coughs> I had a 45 minute time box. The time box expired. May I have your permission to go with this meeting for 10 more minutes? Or shot. Right. Anybody not agreeing to this, let me know and I'll end the meeting right now. If you have other commitments, I understand. My time box is 45 minutes, the time box is over. If everybody agrees, then only we proceed with extending the time box. If any of you disagree, I will stop this meeting right now. May I have all your permission to proceed? Yes. Yes. 10 minutes. Okay, cool. Clear. And I'm going to say back. I don't have to do all this work. If I have a physical tool, I can just pull it up, draw it, saves time, right? So the question is, any type of conference call meetings with remote teams? The first thing with remote meetings and remote teams is technology and tools, right? You as a facilitator should be well familiar with the tool. You cannot really experiment with the tool at the time of meeting, right? I run the webinar team for the PMI Agile Community of Practice, and we explicitly ask the speaker for a dry run because we want to familiarize themselves with the tool, right? We just check if all their microphone, headsets, <coughs> internet connection, everything is working properly, right? You need to make sure you are familiar with the tool. A lot of times, tools now have participative environment, like Sokoko and uh, uh, Venugen and other environments, right? So you need to really know how things work, right? Even if you are using GoToMeeting, Right? If you're using Adobe Connect, the preferences might be difficult. It's okay to err on the side of preparation, don't err, that erring on the side of not preparing. 
right? So you need to be familiar with it and make it a culture, right? To start meetings on time, right? Time zones, uh, Google Calendar supports multiple time zones. Be considerate with other persons and other cultures time zone. In India, it is okay for people to stay in late until nine o'clock, whereas it's uh, not okay in the US to have a meeting at nine o'clock. Be aware of that, respect that. And fix, one of the challenges working cross-culturally is that definition of 10 o'clock in US is 10 or 10 or five. In India, in other cultures, I mean, I can talk about India because I'm from India, right? 10 o'clock meeting actually means 10 o'clock-ish, <laughs> right? And establish that in your team norms, right? Guys, if a meeting is 10 o'clock, if we don't start at 10 o'clock, we're not going to make full use of the hour. What is that you can do? Thank you. We have 15 minutes, but I only have eight minutes, right? What is that you can do to address this concern, right? Right. This starts at the grassroots level. If you get answers from them, they will hold themselves accountable. If you as a manager give answers, they will not be accountable. Right? Using time box with virtual teams, a similar question. Have I answered all your questions to your satisfaction? Do we have more questions at this point in time? You talked a lot about team norms and establishing preferences. Sometimes yes. you have a meeting where you haven't interacted with the participants participants in advance. Okay, you're doing training at 10 o'clock, here's your people, some of them are there at 10, some of them are there at 10, 10. How do you deal with not repeating everything for the people who are late? A training is not a meeting. A training is a learning opportunity, right? The question was... Okay, fine, so it's a meeting that you don't know all the participants in advance. Yeah, you don't know all the participants in advance. I mean, the question is, uh, how do you really handle training when people are coming late for the training and they are actually going to be missing out stuff? Right? I actually tell them, guys, uh, some of us are late. Uh, you need to catch up. We had the meeting starting at 10 o'clock. You probably can talk to me later, and I can help you out with the stuff. And if you're doing some activities, I'll uh, keep you up to speed uh, when I uh, am giving activities to other people, and then I'll get you up. Or you can catch up with the other people, and then get up to speed. Right? Any questions which needs to be answered? Yes. Well, no, I was just going to say for her, mm -hmm. if you send out an agenda and send out, if you don't know these and you're setting up a meeting. If you send out an agenda ahead of time, and kind of, as you say, if, if you establish some norms and put that in the agenda or at the bottom. Yeah. Um, so so not these people, that's your norms, you just say this is what we're doing? Yeah, this is our meeting norms, if you will, yeah. for, for the meeting. And if they have all that ahead of time. I like that. You know, you have an agenda. I mean, you know your participants ahead of time. You can just send out the agenda and you can say like, hey guys, we'll be starting at 10 o'clock. Sure. So be here at 9.30 or 9.45, right? right? Yeah. And give them directions, give them location, any other constraints which they might encounter. Just make it easy for them to actually be there at 10 o'clock. Any other question which needs to be answered? Anybody tweeting about this meeting? Oh, thank you. Right. Yes, sir. You had uh, some of the attendees and deeds could be there for status to find out what's going on. Oh. I've had a situation where somebody would come to my meeting every week and not contribute. Oh. And I would go to the person and say, why, why is it that you're here? Oh. oh, my boss wants to find out what's going on. I said, you don't have to come anymore because we publish minutes in this meeting. So Interesting. You those, so you can see those minutes. You can go and do your job. You don't have to waste your time. Yeah. Uh, what is your question? That's my observation. Oh, it's an observation. It's observ yeah. Somebody at a meeting just for stats, which you publish with. Yeah. So somebody has, uh, I mean, he is actually saying that there's an observer in one of his meetings, right? What he's saying is like somebody's boss asked somebody, some person A, to actually represent him in the meeting as an observer. So you need to clarify the role of the particular observer in that particular status meeting, right? One thing you need to be mindful of with observers is that mere presence in the meeting biases the meeting. If I have a status meeting, right, and uh, a daily stand-up meeting, and if I have my CEO come in for my daily status <laughs> meeting, the guy says, guys, uh, sorry guys, I was talking with this DBA, and uh, man, uh, Sam is not really helping us. Uh, he has other stuff to do, right? That might be the thing which he might say when CEO is not there, but if the CEO is there, he would say, oh, everything is going fine. We just have some minor database glitches, right? That actually prevents people from knowing the true, true status. So be very mindful of who the observer is and ask the team's permission. 
do you, does a team, as a team, does this person have the permission, have your permission to be an observer in this meeting? Ask them ahead of time so that they know that that person's okay or not okay, right? Sometimes you have scribes taking in notes and sending out meeting minutes. That might be sufficient, right? I have one more, have time for one more question. If you have a question, you can ask me. If not, I am going to conclude. You mentioned the two, Sokoko, Sokoko, VenueGen, uh, write to me. I'll send you, there are tons of tools. Turf, especially for virtual collaboration and virtual uh, trainings. There are a lot of tools. We didn't have them previously. Today we have it. And you can also manage virtual meetings and virtual trainings with that. Right? That, the meeting is not over. We still have time, right? We told you how to close the meeting, right? We answered the parking lot questions. Every meeting ends with this in my meeting, right? What went well in today's meeting? What went well in today's meeting? Time management. Time management, okay. Okay, what else went well in today's meeting? Participation. Sorry? Participation. Participation, okay, what else went well? This side. Answered all the questions. Oh, I answered all the questions, great, right? I framed this question in a positive way. You as a facilitator have to hold your environment very tight, right? I don't ask you what didn't go well, right? I'm asking you what can we do to make this better? So when we actually have this meeting next time, what can we do to make this better? Soft music. Oh, you want to play soft music <laughs> in the background, okay. <laughs> what else can we do? Have pizza. Have pizza. Okay. Okay. Yes, what else can we do to make this meeting better next time? Have post-it notes distributed throughout the room. Great idea. Have post-it notes distributed throughout the room, right? This is how I frame my retrospective of the meeting, right? Wordings paint pictures, and that is what matters when you run a meeting. Facilitation is all about asking the right question and eliciting the right response. I don't want to deal with what didn't really go well in this meeting, because now, the energy level is going down with your question. Right? And I wanted to ask, what can we do better next time? I still maintain the positive energy, right? That might be things beyond one's control in this room. My other second TV did not work. They moved it out, right? I had issues with my laptop, right? You didn't really tell that, right? I don't know why. Okay. But I framed the question in such a way that it's, the energy is always going to be positive. I have one minute left. Okay, these are my references. I'm also there in Delicious. I have a couple of good bookmarks. So you can, yeah, it's old, I know. But you can use that. I've been using that for ages, so I'm just using it. These are great books, Facilitation with Ease. Hone up your facilitation skills a little bit so that you can manage it better. Right. Collaboration Explained, great book by Jean Tebeka. And there are a lot of activities in Agile Retrospectives. And you can look at this. There are tons of references, materials, with all activities which you can do. Right? I'm doing just about fine. Thank you for being here.